Hello everyone, I'm John Cog, I'm the owner of Daniel Smith, and today um, we're going to be going over the luminescent colors. I'll show you um, the family of luminescence that we have, it's 48 colors, uh, for some of the properties. I did post on our site a several page document, and let me show you what that looks like. I have it in reverse, so you can see it. Here we go. So this document right here, that's posted on our site, and it's a great article if you want to take the time to read it. It tells you why a luminescent behaves the way it does. And I'll get back to this in just um, One thing, hello Tarun. Um, the one thing I love to do is to read your comments. Um, I get back to each and every one of you. Hello, Claudia. Um, and I wanted to share with you some of the comments I thought that you would find interesting if you're, if you're not reading um, everybody else's comments. Please leave your comments. Um, I do love reading them again, and um, it's exciting for me to be able to give back information. Hello, Raul. Hello, Giovanni. So one question was asked last time, which pigments are substitutes for cadmiums? Um, as you may know from one of the prior discussions, I no longer use cadmiums. I have cadmium U's. Um, they're made from a mixture of high performance pigments, which are highly light fast and highly opaque. Um, they're quite beautiful and they, and they match the intensity of a cadmium quite well. Um, but there's other things you can use as well. If you wanted to use pyrrol red, so pyrrol red um, matches, to some extent, the cad red. If you wanted to have a cad orange, you can use a pyrrol orange. Um, the, the several hands that we have, light, medium, etc., match the cad yellows. Again, with those. Um, the use, the cad use we make, much more... Um, intense mass tone and match the, the cadmiums much better. But you have some variability there. Um, another question was, is Lunar Earth a single pigment? Yes, Lunar Earth is a single pigment. It's pigment brown number 11. Hello, Raul. Um, there's another question about the similarities and it, are there chemical similarities in different pigments? that reflect the same color. It's a lot more than that. Um, for example, PB29, which is the French ultramarine and the ultramarine, it's exactly the same chemistry, it's exactly the same pigment, but it's pigment size that allows two particles to reflect and absorb light differently that causes the color shift. Again, if you remember back in one of our prior discussions, the French ultramarine is slightly larger, and therefore when light hits it, it goes to the warm or the red. And when the light hits the ultramarine, it goes toward the cool or the green. Uh, PV-19 is another one. PV-19, as you remember, um, is the same pigment, different shades, so different alpha beta particles, but it causes the red, the rose, and the violet are all PV-19, yet are different shade differences. The same would be um, with PW, pigment white, uh, number six, or pigment white, number one. One is buff titanium and one is titanium. Um, they both use the same pigment, PW6, pigment white number six, but it's a different shade. Um, so the answer to that is, it, is it about chemistry? It always comes down to about particle. And so part of, that's, part of that would be correct. If the chemistry um, gives the shape or the um, size of the particle, then yes, because it's all about the particle and its absorption or refraction of light. Um, another question is, is there any plan for a Primatech yellow? Hello, Joanne. Prim Primatech yellows uh, would be very difficult. Um, there's a lot of yellows available in the natural world, not necessarily the Primatech world, but the natural world. 
um, and, many, and you use many of those as an artist. There's ochres, there's siennas, and there's all various um, colors of yellows. Within the mineral world, a lot of the yellows either are too transparent or they're, um, they don't lend themselves to art. An example of that would be sulfur. Sulfur is very pretty. It would be catastrophic to use that within your artwork. Um, it would just beat up all the other pigments. It smells really bad. Uh, there's just all types of negatives to it. So some of the most beautiful minerals and beautiful colors within the natural world can't necessarily be used uh, because they're either transparent at the, at the particle level or there's something that's environmentally not good about them. It takes a lot of work to, um, and I'll be going over Primatex next week, so I'll discuss this, the amount of testing that we go through. Yes, Joy says, um, I love naturals because they can be removed. Remember, if you read the color chart, anything that is non-staining can pretty easily be removed, which allows you to do, you know, put other colors in its place, etc. cetera. Um, so another question is, what is, and this is for me, what, what is an, uh, an inorganic, organic, a natural, or a synthetic? Uh, if it's made in the lab, it's, it's a, we can make water in the laboratory, H2O, and that's synthetic in the lab, we can go out and catch it as rain and it would be natural in that environment. Organic versus inorganic is the other classification. Organics contain at least a, a, a carbon atom within their molecular structure, whereas inorganics contain metal within their, within their uh, chemical structure. And I'll give you an example of both. And there's also something called a hybrid. So within chemistry, it's not always absolute. There's different categories, especially for us in the art world. Um, a good example of a, um, a hybrid would be the phthalos that we talked about at the last, last time. And that would be the uh, pigment brown 15, PB15, and that family. And also the... Um, PB16, which is our new phthalo turquoise. The new thalo, thalo turquoise PB16 contains no copper, so it's just a carbon string. So by definition, it's an organic. The other phthalos, however, contain copper. And because they contain copper, which is a metal, even though they contain carbon, and you might think, well, they're organic, they're considered to be a hybrid because they're both organic and inorganic or a hybrid. Um, inorganics tend to be higher, higher intensity and more light fast um, because of the metal structure. There was uh, another series of questions that were asked before I started this today. And one of them was, is there a difference between um, the old transparent pyrrole that we had and the new transparent pyrrole. There's a slight difference. It's from the same company. It is the same pigment. It's a slightly different chemistry. They no longer make the old one. As I went over probably in uh, the first session, we in the art world are um, taking things really from the, that are made for the car industry. And when the car industry does a change, a lot of the pigment companies say, well, we're not gonna make this anymore. So we buy as much as we can, but that runs out. So there's a slight difference between the two pyrrols, the old and the new, but on washes um, and a mast tail, you can't see it. So it's, it's very, very light at best. Another one was, do pigments run out? And yes, pigments run out. Again, back to the same story. Um, they're dictated by other companies. But I'll give you an example of the Mayan blues. I love the chemistry. Thank you, Janet, that you like it. I thank you. Um, the Mayan pigments. The Mayan pigments, um, there's a whole series of them. As you know, we have the genuine, and the genuine is indigo infused into clay. And then under high temperature, it's set. And we probably have um, five to 10 years of that on hand at all times. Um, the other Mayan co colors, there was, 
there was an issue with the Mayan colors. And the issue was the, the man who, very, very nice man, um, passed away. And it has been hard for the company to figure out exactly how the Mayan colors were made. They're um, in the process of trying to uh, figure it back out again. Uh, but that happens as well. Some colors are made by individuals. And if something happens and it's not uh, put into some um, software that it can be retrieved, it's hard to get back. Uh, one question was, what color would I use if I wanted to paint Fire Engine Red? And probably the closest thing that we have to Fire Engine Red would be the Pyrrol Red. Pyrrols are very intense colors. Um, you probably know this. Um, hello, Julia from Lidwood. Um, another question was asked about the, um, the geophyte, which is a brown ochre. Um, so I'm going to read this. So I'm sorry if my eyes look down, but I want to make sure that you get the full information. So that particular color is an iron-bearing hydroxide. Um, it's found in the soil and other low-temperature environments as a sediment. Um, it's, been well know, it's been well known for ancient times because it's brown ochre, and evidence has been used for it as a paint even in the caves in France and Lascaux. But what I found was really super interesting. Um, it comes from the ancient kingdom of Pargia. That's P-H-R-Y-G-I-A. And um, it was believed to be found on King Gordius, which was the father of King Midas. And at that time, if the, uh, the geothite was put over a robe and it was fresh, it would look like gold. And that's why they believe there is the thing from King Midas that he had, might, King Midas had the golden touch, and it comes from that. So it's kind of neat that we paint with things or we create, uh, create paints and use paints that have such a long lineage, um, thousands, hundreds, tens of thousands of years. So as uh, someone who makes uh, paint, people that, as yourself, who are able to use paint, we have a great lineage back through time. It's actually really wonderful. Hello, Nicole from Montreal. Um, how is art watercolors best protected? Um, one of the best ways is still through UV glass and then put out of direct sunlight. Um, it will last a very, very long time. There are, there are also sprays that you can use. Um, sometimes they can be a little bit problematic because we have watercolors which can be re-wet. It can sometimes change your painting, so you have to be really super careful. Let's see. I think that's all I had for questions. I love your questions. Please ask me questions. I will absolutely get back to you. Hello, Connie from Texas. So what we talked about a little bit before we go into the luminescence is the what makes them different. Well, the luminescence um, are a layered pigment. They're multi-layered. It's like a, having a, um, instead of a piece of bread being the, the particle, it's like having a sandwich with eight layers. And those layers are made up of different types of metals. They're made up of titanium dioxide. They're made up of mica. They're made up of silica dioxide. And because there's different layers, there's different absorption. There's different scattering of light. There's different reflection of light, all within the same, um, within the same uh, particle, which allows it to have the duochrome, the iridescent, or the interference. The other type, both inorganic and organic, have absorption of light, and then the reflection of light. And then metals are even uh, another category, which are different, and there's a different refraction of light within the metals. So three different types of, um, of way you see light. And again, this article, I will show it to you again in reverse. This article, which is on the Daniel Smith site, it's also on Facebook, is excellent if you'd like to um, know more about light. And really, 
Bottom line, as an artist, what you're doing all the time is you're manipulating light. You are really, I know somebody else patented the word, but you are all painters of light. And it's how you manipulate um, the watercolor pigment and particle that you're getting the different shades, etc., from your paintings. It's, it's actually quite marvelous. Do the luminescence mix well with other pigments? Yes, they do. Um, anything you mix them with, I'm gonna show you a sample of it here as we talk. Anything you mix them with um, will have that sparkle. So you really need to decide when you want it and when you don't want it. Um, and I will show you some examples right here, right now. Um, I did post to the site, I'm doing a presentation, it's called In the Artist Studio, where I'm meeting with um, artists uh, through Zoom and asking them to show you as the viewer um, their studio, their method of painting, what goes through their mind from a creative process, how they go about um, making a painting. Um, lots of them do color studies, a lot of them do uh, drawings, a lot of them do total values. Um, I've been discussing and talking with artists for um, a decade, and I will say I am mesmerized by what you do and how you do it, and I'm always learning something. So I think you might find them extremely interesting. Um, I think learning process of how somebody else does something or how they see the world to be very illuminating. So again, those will be on the website. The first, uh, one of the ones up there right now is Alvaro Castanet. If you know Alvaro, you know he's a man that has huge amounts of energy. You can see that creativity in his paintings. Um, he talks about how he goes about doing his paintings. Um, and you can see his studio. It's actually his son's room right now because he can't get to his studio. And I'm doing this with a lot of artists um, and Alvaro's up right now. So I think you might enjoy that. So uh, one question is, do the, do the Primatex mix well? Do the luminescence mix well? Um, how can I, as an artist, test them? We have something, we have two things which allow you to be able to test really super well. And that is a 66 color dot card that has quite a few of the quinacridones. Um, it has quite a few of the luminescent colors and it has quite a few of the Primatex. So it's 66 of those various colors. The other one that we have is a 238 dot card, which I'm gonna show you right here. And the 238 is just that, it's 238 colors. Hello, Claudia from Olympia, our neighbors down the road. Um, it has all of the iridescent. It has all of the pyrroles, all of the perilines. Um, it has all of the primatex and, and quinacridones. So let me show you a couple. Uh, I'm going to show you upside down, so this is going to drip, but and my water's not the cleanest. But let me show you how how fast they go into solution. This is CAD U, CAD U right here. And again, because we use gum arabic, they go they come out of uh, they go into solution very very quickly. So it's a good way for you to see what the color looks like. You can see its characteristics. And it's, it's a great way to have a reference tool. Again, I'm all about, hello Sandy from Federal Way. I'm all about providing artist tools to be in their toolbox and for you to use those any way that you want to use them. I think that is the um, best thing any any company that provides a resource can do is to give you tools for your toolbox. So one of the questions was asked, how well do the um, iridescence go back when they're dry? Well, the iridescence or the luminescence go back uh, pretty easily. Again, they're mica or silica or titanium, so they tend to act like shingles and they get very tight. So where you can take a pyro and instantly wet it out, or a quinacridone, and instantly wet out a quinacridone. 
I mean, instantly, instantly wet it out. You need to put some water, you need to put a little bit of water on the iridescent and to allow those mica particles or silica to come apart. And then you'll see it. Again, it's over white. We're going to see in a second. It's always better over a dark. But yes, it'll, it'll, come, it'll come apart very, very quickly. So this is a great tool. Again, it's, it's, it's four sheets. It probably has the cost of maybe two tubes of paint. Um, but you know, from this, you know exactly what you'll get. You'll be able to see it. And, and as an artist, um, it's all about what you can see. Um, and the neat thing is you can also feel it because I think art artists have two qualities that they use when they're looking at color. They want to see it, but they also want to feel it through that brush. And this allows you to do it. I could talk a lot, but for me, it's also what can I see and what can I feel? And this tool is a great tool. Hello from Croatia. Hello, Rajat. So I'm gonna walk you over to look at the um, iridescent colors. There's 48 of them, the, the luminescent colors. And I'm gonna go over the different qualities. Um, I'm gonna probably shake my camera a little bit. So I apologize for that. I don't want you to get uh, seasick through the phone, uh, but it'll just take me a second to go to the table behind me. Okay, so just give me a moment. Okay, and flip. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the iridescent colors. And again, there's 48, luminescent, I'm sorry. There's iridescent, interference, duochrome, and pearlescent. And I'm gonna show you um, all of them. So here's kind of what they look like. Okay, and now, now we'll look. Oh, Vicky has them all. Oh my God, that's impressive, Vicky. Now we'll look at um, a couple of them, of each family. So first we have the iridescent. And the iridescent, and this is iridescent electric blue. The iridescent you can see over white and over black. And again, this right here is just black that we use to show you the difference between white paper and what it looks like over a dark. It doesn't have to be black, it could be dark blue, dark green. Um, it could be anything that's dark will really make this pop. And here's kind of what it looks like. Okay, so you can see it over white and black. That's an iridescent. Let me give you another example of an iridescent. Here's iridescent moonstone. So again, you can see it granulates and it has that really very cool color over a dark. Okay, so let me show you one more. We'll look at scarab. This is scarab red. So the interesting thing, you see it's red over, kind of reddish over the white, a little bit greenish over the dark, but yet it will change colors. And you can see that brown, even on the dark, as I move it, it still has, it still has the, the, um, the reddish, reddish brown to it, depending on how I project it. Okay, so that's, that's a case of iridescent. Let me show you interference.
Okay, so here's two examples of interference. And interference, you see very difficult to see over white, but you can see it over black. And let's see what that looks like. This is interference silver. Okay. And this is interference copper. Again, hard to see over the white, easy to see over a dark. Scarab isn't a duochrome because a duochrome means a specific thing. And I'm going to show you that next, Nisha. Um, let me show you a couple more a couple more iridescence. So if you didn't want something to show over white, interference would be a nice color. If you did want it to show, again, the iridescent would be good. So this is another iridescent. And you can see they take on definitely a different look. You can see a little bit in the white as I move it, but over dark is where they super, super pop. And here's iridescent gold. So it shimmers depending on the aspect of the viewer. Um, all, the light that's in the room will help it. Certainly you need light, but it's also the aspect of the viewer. So if they're coming from you know, either side or straight on, they're gonna see something different. A lot of artists are using these to, um, to really make the eyes come alive because if you look at our eyes, our, our eyes always have light in them and it's a good way to, to show that light. So let me show you a duochrome. Now, our duochrome, duo means it's one pigment that shifts to two different colors. So let me show you. This is duochrome violet fantasy. And you can see here, you really can't see this one um, over white that well, but you can see it over dark. And let's see what we get here. Oh, so it gets really super intense. Very intense. You can see how one side, it changes. That's a duo. It's, it changes one side perspective of light, and then boom, it changes to a different. That's what's meant by duochrome. So the difference between the three, again, iridescent, you can see it over white, interference, you can't see it over white, and duochrome is one pigment that shifts to two colors. See that? It looks, it looks like hibiscus on one side, but if you move it, you can actually see it changes color. So it's one pigment that can go to two colors. That's duochrome. How many washes are on the black side? This is just one wash. This is made with um, Daniel Smith, Daniel Smith uh, black, black watercolor ground. Daniel Smith black watercolor ground. And it's just a reference. I take all these from my chemist, and my chemist, every time they do a batch, they do a drawdown, and I, I go in and I just take their drawdowns. Yeah, they're beautiful for, for butterfly wings, hummingbirds, um, dragonflies, which, you know, have that really cool uh, metallic look to them that changes. Um, they work fantastic for that. So that's the main difference between the three families. There's one other one, and it's called pearlescent. And let me get out the pearlescent for you. Oh, here we go. So pearlescent and pearlescent shimmer. Both of these, the pearlescent and the pearlescent shimmer are exactly the same pigment. And you can see the pearlescent shimmer is, is brighter and that's because the particle size is larger. And because it's larger, while they're, while they're both transparent, this one can be seen as a little bit more opaque, but it adds, if you wanna add it uh, throughout your painting, both of these can be very good to use because really all you're getting is the shimmer. You're not getting another color. You're not getting a hibiscus or a emerald. You're getting a just the pearlescent, okay? So that's the pearlescent shimmer. You can see it adding to the white on this side. And here's the, so this is the pearlescent. 
smaller particle, and here's the pearlescent shimmer, larger particle. So depending on how much you wanted to add, you can use one of these two to change it. Oh, the two lights I'm using, I'm using what's called a Stella. And you can change with, with these right here, with these lights, you can um, change the color. So I find that very useful and have one on both ends. I use them on my desk, it, it helps my eyes. Okay, so the second thing I wanted to show you today, I wanted to show you, since many of you ask, I want to show you the watercolor ground. So the watercolor ground we have in colors. And those are, we have them in gold. I'm sorry, I lost you for a second. We have it in gold. We have it in um, pearlescent. And what you can do with a watercolor ground, it makes anything that you put it on a, a watercolor surface. So you could put it on metal pie tins. You can put it on candles. You could put it on cardboard. Boxes. You can put it on cards and then stamp the card and then paint, paint it. This one is the gold. This one is the pearlescent. Um, you can make your own cards. So what we're trying to do here is give the watercolor artist to move beyond just a uh, watercolor paper now, in 24 hours, um, you can make anything a watercolor surface. And it just gives that more flexibility. Again, we're always looking at how we add more tools for the, for the watercolor artist. Um, next week, we will go over watercolor sticks. So you'll be able to see the watercolor sticks. I'll bring those in. Um, but this is just something else that allows the watercolor artist to go beyond just a paper. So I'm going to bring you back to my desk now. Okay, is there a difference between how the paint flows on watercolor paper and the, with, um, the watercolor paper is always gonna be the best because it's, we're trying to simulate that with the watercolor ground, but watercolor paper is always gonna be um, the best way. The watercolor ground acts just the same as a watercolor paper, when you when you when we try to create it, what you want from a watercolor paper is if this was my watercolor paper, and just make believe it's this thick. We want the we want the watercolor to go about halfway, and about half to stay up on top. If it goes if it goes all the way into the substrate, then or absorbed, you don't have the refraction of light. You don't have color. You have dullness. If it stays all on the top then it washes away um, and you don't get, again, get the same uh, refractive properties. So it's, it's, that, it's that method that we try to have it go about halfway in with half on top that gives the best result. And that's how we crafted the watercolor ground. So no, there's not a, there's not a big difference. Uh, when you have watercolor paper, you have sizing, a lot of times that's um, although some companies are moving to, to vegetable, but it's the sizing that stops it going all the way through and therefore losing um, the uh, refractive index of the color that you see. Yes, Sandy is absolutely a wonderful person. I know she's doing videos all the time. Uh, she's great. She's one of our brand ambassadors. We're, we're so proud to have her and so lucky to have her. So the quins and the perilines, um, there's differences chemically. The quin is a, um, is a five ring structure. 
that has alpha and beta particles. So as that string can be manipulated, you get different shades. That's why even though you have PV19, you have three different shades because of how they move. Um, they're both made for the car industry. They're both um, high intensity pigments, wonderful, wonderful pigments. Um, so how they differ, that's how they differ chemically. The perylenes are seven ring, are, are seven ring structure, minimum seven rings. Um, and then they're both high intensity. Um, you could look at the color chart and see what other differences they have. Some are gonna be transparent, some semi-transparent, some uh, whether they're staining or non-staining, that would be your difference. But they're both very, very bright, uh, high-performance pigments. Um, so Christoph is watching. How easy it is to lift off and layer on watercolor ground? The watercolor ground should behave just like a watercolor paper. Um, again, you would have to uh, try that with just like not every paper arch isn't the same as Fabriano. Fabriano is not the same as Lana Acquarelle. All papers, because there's all different sizings, are gonna behave somewhat differently. And you learn that as you paint. I mean, you probably know your paint super well and what does or doesn't come off. Um, you would have to try that with the ground. Uh, the ground, when we use our colors, behaves very similar um, to uh, the Lana Acquarelle, but then you'd, you'd wanna test that and, and play with it. Thank you, Bill. Um, I, I love to learn. I've had great teachers. I, I have great teachers all the time. When I travel, I'm, I'm blessed to have artists give me input um, and their knowledge, which I love. And if I can pass that on, I'm, I'm so very, very happy. Um, I didn't show you this, but I think I mentioned it last time, but I'll show you again. This is a set from Gene Haynes and it's called All That Shimmers, and it has six five mil um, luminescent colors. So if you don't wanna buy the, uh, go out and buy a 15 mil, this is a, a very good way. And then an excellent way, of course, um, is to buy the 238 dot card, which has all of them, and that way you can see them. My favorite paper, um, so I'm not an artist, so I would look at it a little bit differently. When I look of, of how I want my um, product to be Lana Acquarell, and just because Lana what, may not be um, the best for watercolors to use to do um, artwork, it is phenomenal in terms of their sizing. It's one company that year after year, decade after decade, has maintained their sizing. They are just so unbelievably consistent. And when you're making uh, paint, you wanna make sure when you put it on a substrate, it's not the substrate uh, showing you a difference because if we see a difference between the prior batch and the current batch, we go back to chemistry and that's a lot of time. And we wanna, just like you as an artist, we wanna reduce as many variables as possible. And so one of those is using lawn, it's very consistent. Arsh paper is a very beautiful paper. Um, but it does have, and you probably know this as, as watercolors, from time to time has sizing issues. Um, and while that's, that's easier to overcome when you're, you're painting, it's very difficult when you're trying to compare colors. You, you want consistency. Um, yeah, you know, what, what I've been told by many, what I consider to be unbelievably good artists is, Art's all about color, and it's really, it's all about having fun, and you should have fun with the color. So you don't really have to uh, necessarily be the best in drawing, uh, that helps uh, immensely. Um, I can do stick figures, but I love playing with color. So when people say, are you an artist? No, I'm not an artist, but I love colors just as you do, of playing with them, and um, just putting them on paper and see how they behave. And the more, the more in the artist studios I've done, I've done 27 of them, I see that that's really consistent with artists as well. They love to play with the colors before they ever do a painting, just to see 
um, what that color, what those colors, what the combination and the interplay can do. So I think it's, it's probably um, the same for all of us. We, we really love color. Yes, repeat the paper I had mentioned. This one's online. It's called Three Dimensional Color. Let me find, I'm trying to find the one that's in reverse so you can see it. Here we go. So up here. So you can find that online. It's a, it's a great it's a great article. If you can't find it, leave a message in your comments, and I'll send you the link. You know, um, I'm I'm glad to do that. Oh boy, um, I like I I too love the my favorite are blues. I love the cobalt blues, the cobalt the the teal blues, um, the ultramarines. Um, I'm a, a, a big fan of blues, although I love the pyrals. Um, I love mixing just for play because I'm not an artist, but just to play. Um, I love mixing with the, the uh, Cascade Green. Um, a lot of the quinacridones when they're mixed just give interesting, um, interesting results. So mine's just from a playing standpoint. Yeah, the, the, so one, uh, it's asked about the 15, about the Primatex. And we do have um, some of the Primatex. We have six of them um, in a five mil set, just so people can try them out. Um, but the Primatex, we don't bring them out in five mil uh, just because worldwide, brick and mortar only have so much space. And space in Europe, for example, in parts of Asia, even in the U.S., it's 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 such um, there's so so little of it. So it's we we try to bring out enough that that artists can can see them, can test six to twelve at a time. Um, the colored dot cards are another thing that we use, but there's no uh, and we also have them in pans. Um, So Tammy, um, I see your message and I'll send you the link. Anybody else, if you're having difficult finding that the 3D um, color, I'll send it to you. When I go back tonight, I'll go through all of your comments and I'll send it to you. Is there a pigment that might be extinct soon? Um, you know, there's lots of pigments and uh, the quinacridones, uh, for example. I know quinacridone burnt orange, which is beautiful, um, probably won't be available in four years. I have, I have 15 years worth, um, at least, but probably in four years in general, um, companies won't be able to buy it. I know that we get notified. We were notified on that particular color because it's not going to be used for, um, in the car industry any longer. So we have about 15 years of it. Um, but yeah, the, the, the colors, um, we're, we're, we're kind of, uh, very in a good position that we can take from from huge companies that that pay to have these new colors made uh, but when they no longer want them we don't have them do the lunar colors belong in the primitive family no they don't so the and the reason that the lunars don't is that they're synthetics and when looking at primitech you're looking at naturals you're looking at uh minerals so when we say hematite I-T-E, malachite, I-T-E. Um, I-T-E means mineral. And the Primatex are from a mineral family. There's a couple of exceptions to that. Pipestone is an exception to that because it's kind of a clay. And the, the Mayan blue, genuine, is an exception to that because it's indigo infused into clay. But they all have a pedigree of history behind them. You can see them in temples. You can see them throughout history that they were used. That's why they're Primatech, Primitive Technology, which I'll go over um, quite a bit next time. So please ask those questions so I can add those into our discussion for next time. Sandy posted the link right there. Sandy, thank you very much. So if you're having trouble, find it. Sandy just posted the link. Um, 
Yes, thank you, Sandy. Yeah, the, the brush loading video, if you've not seen the brush loading video by Lauren McCracken, it's excellent. Um, Lauren tells you how to load and unload a brush, um, which I thought was phenomenal. Um, it's, a, it's a great tip. If you don't haven't seen it, it's great to watch the, the 10 minutes of it. Um, so Mel, there, there was probably somebody watching information to you. You can also send an email to Jane Blondell. Jane Blondell is also very knowledgeable about pigments. And as an artist, she's used them all. Um, she can give you some great input. Jane Blondell, she's from Australia, Sydney. Um, we also did it in the artist studio with Jane Blondell, which is actually gonna be quite wonderful. Um, Giovanni posted the link as well. Thank you, Giovanni. So next week, we're gonna go over the Primatex. Um, I, will be, I will be sending you um, some videos of my manufacturing facility. So I'll show you how, what the machines are and what they do. I have more than one facility. One facility is for the processing of pigment. Um, difficult to watch because my, my, my um, uh, staff are dressed up like uh, space suits. Um, but you can see some of the machines, which I'll show you. And then we'll show um, how from beginning to end, how a color is made. So we'll go through a history of one color all the way through all the processes. So you can see that. It'll be exciting. And after Primatex, somebody had mentioned uh, about blacks. And I think what I'll do is do a story on blacks and a story on grays. Um, uh, more and more people are trying grays. Uh, we have um, Joseph, uh, Joseph's grays, which are beautiful. We have Alvaro's grays, which are beautiful. And we have Jane's gray, all beautiful, beautiful grays. Um, Serpentine Genuine. Serpentine Genuine is one of my favorite colors for one of my favorite places in the entire world. Um, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just beautiful. Okay. Yes, I think inside the factory you'll like it. Love, yeah, neutral tint. A lot of people use neutral tints. Um, a lot, uh, many artists are, are actually doing whole paintings with uh, neutral tints, which is very, very interesting. I'll bring over how neutral tints are used, um, but you can also use them just in straight painting. Thank you, Mel. The, uh, the, the, my, the new, the new grays are, are really beautiful. Okay, thank you all for watching. I really appreciate you coming. Um, I know for some of you it's late. I was trying to do two of them, so it met the time frame for most people. We do post these. Um, I do read my posts. I don't. I don't wait till uh, the same day to read them. I read them the same day. I'll read them, you know, six days later to see if anybody asks additional questions. Please ask questions. Um, if you don't want me to use your name when I reply, just say, just use my first name or don't use my name, but don't feel embarrassed to ask questions. I love questions. Um, they're, um, to be a little bit unfair, they're really good for me because I, I, I love them. I love to be able to grow. I love to, to know what you're thinking about. Um, if you have ideas, please share those with me. Um, Tarun, um, out of India, phenomenal distributor, great man, love him to death. Thank you, Tarun. Um, thank you all. And with this, I'm going to end. Uh, thank you again next week. Let me hold up this sign. It's going to be Thursday. I mean, it's going to be Friday at the same time. Okay. So Friday at the same time. I look forward to seeing you. Please put your, put your questions in. I love those and I appreciate you coming. Thank you also very, very much.